Hello, everyone, and welcome to Web3 Unpacked. Today, we welcome Spencer Israel, executive producer, video for Magnify TV. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, Spencer, you had a bit of a, a career jump. You were at Benzinga originally. Uh, I guess maybe for our viewers, just give us a little bit of your background and how you arrived at where you are right now. Sure, sure. Uh, so, I guess graduate college in uh, 2013, always thought I was going to go into the sports media world. That was always my plan. Uh, kind of fell backwards into an opportunity at Benzinga. Uh, a couple of years later, I uh, moved out to uh, Detroit in 2015, uh, a few years after school to work there and have an adventure. I'd never been to Michigan before in my life, so I uh, figured, you know, what the hell, why not? Um, Pretty stunning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great place. Uh, yeah. Spent seven years uh, in Michigan, seven years at Benzinga, doing all sorts of stuff. I was an editor for a while. Uh, then I became uh, the executive producer of all their video. Uh, then just, uh, I guess last year now, uh, in August, I moved back to New Jersey, uh, with my wife and we, uh, uh, settled down here and I just started working literally with the turn of the calendar at a new job. So it's been, it's been a whirlwind. We got married in November, new job now. So it's been a wow, whirlwind. what a, <clears throat> what a way to start the new year Yep, for sure. Yep. Now, Spencer. You've got a huge history with, <clears throat> excuse me, creating content, live streaming, video. Mm -hmm. What do you, I mean, I think we all know the, the answer to this, but really from your, through your lenses, what do you see the most effective types of content uh, as it, as it is, as it relates to almost anything, but you know, the world of finance, I guess. Wow. <laughs> okay. This is kind of a cop out, but like the most effective kind of content is whatever content works for you, right? So like, um, it could be video, it could be long form video, it could be short form video, it could be written, long form, short form. Uh, it, every podcast, long form, short form, everything is on the table and there is no one size fits all approach. Um, and so I have found in my experience, you try to cover as many bases as you can uh, if you're in the content game, right, which I am, you want to cover as many bases as you can. You want to be doing some video, some writing, some newsletters, some, some, some podcasts, because I'm, you know, I'm also a consumer of content, right? I have my own podcast and things that I listen to and the things that I read and I like them my way. Right. So, and there have certainly been times when like I've stopped engaging with some, with something because they stopped doing it the way I like it, right? Like they, they stopped writing it or they stopped doing a podcast. And like, I, I don't want to read about you. I'd, I'd rather listen to you, right? So I'm, I'm out, right? So, so the most engaging content is whatever works and that's everything, unfortunately. So uh, mm. no one size fits all approach uh, and you got, you got to diversify, man. It's, it's like investing, you got to diversify. Yeah, you brought something up interesting there. Um... You know, obviously what works for you and your organization, but we, we are seeing like a lot of podcasters in particular shifting gears. Um, we, we see it a lot. Um, a lot of, a lot of podcasters and, you know, reporters are getting dinged these days. Um, but we're seeing, especially in the web three space, I think for obvious reasons, uh, podcasters are, you know, shifting gears, you know. I, look, I mean, the barrier to entry to become a podcaster is like almost nothing, right? Yeah. Like, like anybody can do it, and and I say that as as a podcaster myself, right? Like anybody yeah. can do it, right? And, and that's the reality, and um, that's a good thing, but, but it's also a bad thing, right? Because yeah. it means uh, that, like, I think I saw this stat; it's probably like outdated by now, but like. The top one percent of podcasts generate like ninety percent of the revenue, uh, right? In terms of sponsorships and things like that, or or even like listenership. Like it's really, really hard to actually grow a podcast. And I think people probably thought, "Oh, this is easy. I can start a podcast." That's true. It is easy to start a podcast, but it's very hard to grow a podcast. And that's probably what they're finding out. So yeah, there's, <clears throat> there's some churn, and that's just kind of the way it is. 
we certainly uh, understand the idea of growing networks, communities, and yeah. podcasts for sure. Yeah, uh, we're squarely rooted in that. Um, we've got a good start, but we're just starting. So yeah, uh, you know, and we're listening. You, you guys know what you know know that as well as anyone, right? Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's 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 hard. Um, you you really got to find a niche. You, you asked me, you know, to the previous question, what's the best type of content? Uh, like in terms of subject matter, like niche is where it's at. Like the more niche, like I, I have found, the, like the better. Like the, the days of the generalists are long, long gone, right? Like you cannot be everything to everyone <clears throat> all the time. It's just not <clears throat> going to happen. You got to be specific you got to have a niche and this can be basically anything right so you're yeah. kind of you're at magnify now but when you were at benzinga yeah. can you kind of give us an example of what you mean by that niching yeah, yeah. Niching so i'm making a verb here but that right, right so it's it, it comes down to like, it, like at, at benzinga for example like that we always wanted to target the active trader the active trader and the active investor so people who are like either they're trading every day or like at the very least, they're looking at the market every single day, right? So that's who we were after, right? So everything that we did was geared towards reaching that person, okay? So that meant a lot of like focusing on the minutia of, of the day, like the minutia news of the day, the minutia news of the pre-market session, news that will be literally irrelevant 12 hours from now, that's fine, right? Because because we, 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 want, we want this, we want the fast news, we want it now. Um, you know, not so much interested in like the macro stuff, not talking about yield curves or, or the housing market. It's, it's like micro news now fast. Right. Uh, and cause that, that was, that was who, who we were at, who we were always after. Now in, from a, a niche standpoint, that yeah. totally makes sense. Are you speaking, were you speaking more to institutional investors or more like the day trader type of it. Yeah, more more the retail side of the market, more 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 the day traders, um, or, or or again just people who are just in just looking at the market, you know, um, every day or you know maybe a few times a week. People who are actively managing their money in some way, shape, or form. It's similar to <laughs> to to the audience that that I'm that I'm trying to reach uh, here at uh, Magnify. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, you know, it, it, gets, it comes down to just knowing your audience, right? Knowing who you want to reach and then like figuring out what do they want. Yeah, and, and speaking to audiences, um, I, I don't think it's apples and oranges. There's tons of similarity between Web3 kind of crypto, I should say, uh, trading versus traditional. What do you... How, how do you see the differences between those two crowds? Because it's definitely, Ooh. there's some definite diff differences for sure. In, in terms of like the crypto trading crowd and the, the stock market trading crowd? Yeah, maybe it could be like habit. Yeah, exactly. So it could be habits. It could be, you know, techniques. It could be attitudes, anything. I mean, they're very similar. Um, you know, crypto doesn't have a lot of like, like a, a ton of underlying fundamentals and these not nearly as much as like stocks do, for example. So if you're trading crypto, all you really have to go off of is the chart. That's kind of, and that's, and that's technical analysis and that's totally fine. And, and so in that way they overlap because technical analysis like a, is, is a, you know, huge school of thought for, for, for uh, stock market trading people that are in stocks, you know, they have other things they can look at. They can look at company financials, Right, they can go look at you know SEC filings uh, if they want. Those those things don't really exist uh, for crypto. Um, so mm -hmm. in that sense, there uh, there's a lot of overlap in, in in the people that just are, are chartists and they're all about the charts. Um, in terms of behavior, it's very very similar. Um, you know, I think in, in a lot of crypto is proven itself to be a growth asset in just the way it's behaved. Um, so the people that are attracted to high growth stocks are the same people who are attracted to crypto, right? So there's a lot of overlap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We see, um, we, it's kind of interesting because you're right there, it, the, two different breeds, kind of similar cloth, but different breeds. Um, you know, crypto 
even the more of the the I would say the newer uh, investor types were very knee jerk, very happy to just jump in like literally head first. Um, you know, whereas the traditional you know two point investment world is a little more cautious. There's a little bit more data to to dip into. Um, you lift the hood a little bit a little bit further uh, in those regards. So there's real lessons for for crypto investors from the from the you know traditional world to be taken from you know um yeah yeah i agree yeah definitely find, for sure do you find that the crypto investors are generally I, I mean because there is at some level projects of interest that you can follow when you trade uh do you find that it's purely the chart analysis from the traders or is there Okay, Solana is going to do this, or Cardano is going to do that. Like, like attention to the projects that goes into your trading strategy. So, so we, we have to clarify who we're talking about here. Are we talking about investors or are we talking about traders? Those are very different things, right? The traders, yes. the traders are the chartists, the guys and, and, and girls looking at support, resistance, Fibonacci, all, all all these tried and true technical analysis methods. The investors are not doing that, I, or maybe they're doing both, but they're they're very different things. I guess yeah. If you could, let's break down each. I think both would be great. Yeah, I mean, from a tra again, from a trading standpoint, they're very similar. You don't really have a lot to go on off of for crypto outside of the charts. Like there is some underlying crypto fundamental data there, but like not a ton. So it's if you're trading crypto, you're all about the chart, and that's totally fine. Um, from an investment standpoint, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's much more difficult now. Um, or I mean, the biggest challenge from, you know, when it comes to investing is always like from a behavioral point of view. And this applies to every asset. It doesn't matter what stocks or crypto or whatever. Right? It's always like a behavioral question because you're fighting yourself, right? Because investing is long-term thinking. It's not short-term thinking, right? So it's like if you're an investor and like I, I consider myself an investor in like Bitcoin only because I've never sold. Like I literally bought, I bought like a little bit of Bitcoin, like, a little over a year ago, right? So, and I haven't sold. I guess that makes me an investor, right? I don't know. I'm long term, uh, but like, it's a very different kind of thinking. I don't know. I don't even know. If I answered your question. You're a maximalist now. <laughs> I don't know what that makes me. I I, 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 I bought a few cryptos um, around the end of nineteen, uh, the end of twenty, early twenty one, um, just for fun because I had never bought it before, and just so just yeah. for fun. Right. And then, you know, it, that's all. It, but that's all it is for me. It's fun. It's not it's not going to change my life in any way. Yeah, it is a mindset and it is a shift. And, you, you know, you hit on a couple of points that are really important and things that we echo here is we don't talk a lot about investments, but you know, think of it long term. Everyone thinks of it as like, I'm going to be, you know, it's all, uh, you know, blue skies and Lambos uh, in, in four weeks, you know, when I'm a, a bajillionaire. I, and it, it doesn't it doesn't work that way. It never did. It never will. Well, maybe for a few, if you happen once in a while. I mean, that's like, yeah, lotto. of course. Yeah. It's like hitting the lotto, though. Yeah, but it, it's, it's easy to say you're an investor when markets are going up. Right. The real test is yeah. when they're going down. Right. That's how you know who is full of it and who is not. Like, are you really yeah. an investor or are you, were you, or can you not take the heat? And it's totally fine. It's, it's okay to admit that to yourself and to others. Well, I, 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 for whatever reason, I, I, I can't take this. Um, and th that's okay. Selling isn't a crime. Right. It's just, it's just mm -hmm. the way it is, though. Everyone's an investor on the way up. Who's an investor on the way down, though? I don't know. Yeah. How you how are you uh, dollar cost averaging when things are low? Do you have a strategy for it? Yeah, I mean these right. are all things that take time. Yeah, you know? yeah, and people see other people getting rich quickly, and for a lot of people that for some people that was the case, and I mean great for them. <laughs> the reality is we are coming out of an everything bubble. Like the first half of last year was like a everything bubble. It was crypto, it was housing, it was used cars, it was lumber, it was stocks, like everything. Yeah. Um, and that's over now, clearly, right? So, you know, uh, now, now, now we're left to pick up the pieces, right? Um, so, so, yeah, it's a very different market. Um, 
And that's challenging when you're like a nascent asset class like crypto. It's very hard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there's tremendous amounts of, of lessons to keep keep learning for for everyone jumping yeah. in. Sorry, Matt, what were you saying? Oh, no, I was just going to say, uh, not financial advice for anyone, just to clarify, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, as definitely. we delve deep into this. But I am curious to hear your thoughts on everything with FTX yeah. and kind of open up that conversation. We saw, obviously, in crypto, we really did see what we were just talking about, who are the investors in this particular space, and a lot of people, I think, who probably are a little bit scared off. So what are your thoughts, Yeah, uh, just from your vantage point, uh, you know, as, as a more... Mainstream I mean, investor. At, as a as a content person, it's probably the most um <laughs> the most interesting story that's happened in the world of finance in a very long time, right? Since, um, since Bernie Madoff. <laughs> I, I, I mean, maybe. May, maybe, maybe. Um, I think it's, it's, it's if you don't have a lot of money or any money invested in, in crypto, it's very easy to point and laugh. And, and to some extent, you know, pe you know, I've done that, but like, you, you gotta remember, you gotta remember that like, there are people that lost like real money here. And it yeah, was not yeah. just FTX, it was Voyager, it was BlockFi, um, you know, I, I, Celsius. Terra right? Luna, all Terra yeah, Luna imploded. All, all, yeah. Right, people lost real money. And we can debate to a blue in the face whether these people were, were, were responsible, but that's neither here nor there. They lost money. They didn't know they were leaving their money in the hands of a fraudulent psychopath, right? They didn't know <laughs> if they had, they wouldn't have done it, right? So there, there are yeah. real victims here, and and that's the and I think that often gets lost, um, for, you know, uh, because the story itself is so interesting. Um, yeah, but it's wild, man. Uh, absolutely, and you know, part of the, the the narrative that we keep spinning and pushing is, you know, not your keys, not your your coins, um, or your tokens. You know, people just uh, literally jumped in, and there, unfortunately, a lot of the people who got slammed by this were very new investors to yeah, the space, right? That always happens, yeah. It happens. Um, and, you know, where is it? Where are the communications uh, from the organization that you're investing with? Can you see the arbitrage models? Can you, you know, what are the market caps on, yeah. on things? And, 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 you know, they just weren't looking. It was just magical uh, that it was just all going to happen. And, you know, to be honest, everyone, including myself, not so much with, um, with uh, FTX, uh, but other other protocols that I was looking at to invest in, in that had similar models, um, you know, you get caught up in a fever pitch. I, you get you get caught up, and and that's yeah. the other very innocent uh, side of the story is, you know, how could you not know? Well, it's like you're you're saying in hindsight, it's easy to point the finger. But a lot of people, institutional investors, hardcore investors from the the normal, you know, stock exchange got caught up into it. Um, yes. Old yes. school Web3 investors. And, and, so look, and this yeah. happens with every bubble. Like after the fact, everyone's like, wait, that was kind of <laughs> dumb. Now that we think about it, that was right. kind of dumb. But nobody thinks yeah. that in the moment, right? And, yeah. and to me, like one of the biggest ironies of all this, and Matt Levine at Bloomberg pointed this out, by the way, He's been like the best person to, to who's been covering this FTX thing. Um, is like, if you think back to like the early early days of like crypto and Bitcoin, one of the main arguments was that it is trustless, right? You don't have to trust anybody. Trust the code. The code is law. And what ended up happening is you get these centralized exchanges, but they're yeah. also brokers. Yeah, they're, they're brokers and exchanges at the same yeah. time. And everyone trusted this one dude. And this one right. dude was an idiot. Right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the story, irony. Yeah. 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 The, the, the story for us is, you know, centralized versus decentralized. If you're yeah. decentralized, you want to play in that world. It's the same as a bank or yeah. some other finan traditional financial institution managing your money. Uh, and there's only amount, a certain amount of transparency behind traditional uh, investment types. Yeah. Um, and most people just don't understand, truly don't understand the difference between the two. 
decentralization works if it's really decentralized. I, right? I, I think I think this is an argument in favor. This whole event, FTX, is an argument in favor of decentralized finance, right? Because it proves Absolutely. that the centralization has fatal flaws, right? Um, there are other reasons to, to, to like cryptocurrency besides uh, decentralization and, tr and, and trust. That's, you're allowed to like it for other reasons. But if that's your argument, then you have no excuse for leaving your money on an exchange because you violated your own trust principle. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that is what I would call a fundamental lack of, of knowledge around just how these things work. We, I, I mean, if I had a nickel for every time we, we said it on this podcast, you know, those type of exchanges are on ramps and off ramps only. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. it. Um, they do have, you know, investment, you know, play areas, if you will, that you can kind of go and, and, and play in. But you have to understand that, you know, a lot of these tokens that people are using, um, the way we use it is we on road, a, we drip a little bit of money in. We actually use services across uh, Web3, uh, whether it be, you know, DAOs or, or minting uh, NFTs or creating smart contracts. And uh, that's it. We play, we buy, we burn, and then we're off, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and we're using it. We're a little bit different. It's not a, uh, an investment vehicle for us per se. It's more of a, a, a tool. We're using these, this as a tool and people yeah. just don't, don't get it. So, yeah. Mm. Spencer, well, did you, yeah. did you see like red flags with FTX? Because you're a little bit outside of the crypto world. You yeah. Know, you maybe didn't get the, uh, you know, the magical sense that everyone inside the world did. So, so like, I'm not going to sit here and tell you like, oh yes, I saw it coming. Cause <laughs> no one saw it coming. But like, I will tell you that all through the summer, every time there was an FTX or a Sam Bankman free related bailout, I and many others, people that I had talked to were kind of just like scratched in our head. Like, how are they able to do this every time? How can they bail out the BlockFi and Voyager and almost sell, they flirted with, with Celsius too, right? Like, yeah. how are they able to do that? This makes no sense. And yeah. it turned out it didn't make sense. But at the time, like, you can't argue with the headlines. The headlines are what they are. And <clears> they were... They were supposedly doing it. They were the lender of last resort. They were, you know, Warren Buffett in 2008. But, like, it, 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 it seemed weird. To answer your question, Matt, it did seem weird how, like, everybody in crypto was burning down except for this one dude and this one company. Like, that, that was always weird. Mm. That makes sense. So it was like a little bit of a suspicion, not that you could land on it. So you didn't have, like, a strongly negative opinion, but you thought this is – interesting to it say was just least. weird yeah it yeah. was like yeah how does this guy have all this money of course yeah. he didn't but like we didn't know that <laughs> yeah and the 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 other really important lesson <laughs> that comes out of all of this is don't don't follow crypto gods if you will yeah. they're not yeah. gods they're 22 year old uh you know college dropouts or whatever they are or not in sam bankman Freed's, I think uh, he's quite educated. Yeah, he's quite educated. Right, but it, <laughs> as soon as you you know you, you think you're following some some demigod you yeah. know that has powers beyond anyone w within your your world or the finance world, that's where you're going to go wrong. That's where it gets culty and weird. Yeah. and you know people, you know even Mister Wonderful over there got wrapped up in, in San, uh, SBF. He, he still supports him. He still, uh, you know, is going to bat for him, which is totally bonkers in, in my eyes. Um, both guilty, <laughs> both, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, cause I mean, offenses for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've heard this somewhere and I don't know where, but I'm going to steal it. The problem with crypto has never been crypto. It's been the people in crypto, right? The people are the problem, right? Right, who, right. I, that, was, that's it, not my line, but like that, that, that I'm, I'm down with that for sure. Hundred percent. And you know, you said it before. You know, it's supposed supposed to be a trustless system. It is as long as you, as long as it's, it's decentralized, and right. you remove the whole philosophy of crypto is to remove the human, right, and let the machines do the decision making uh, via nodes and validation. 
um, uh, somehow the whole premise just got lost and and in a very big way. Yeah. Yeah. How far do you see, uh, just from your vantage point, the accountability on this going? Do you think uh, we're going to see, do you see this even, uh, the contagion going into more conventional finance at some point as well? Like, like is traditional finance going to be on the hook for this in, in some way, shape or form? I mean, uh, uh, he, Sam Bankman was investing in Robinhood. You know, there's a lot of uh, yeah. There is a lot of there is a lot of ties. Um, um, I, fortunately, for traditional finance, I don't think they they got like too wrapped up in it. Like, like for example, I know I, I, I read like a few weeks ago now that like Congress had asked Fidelity to stop offering crypto in their four hundred one ks. So like. I guess to some extent there's room for some like pullback, you know, on the institutional front. Uh, but I mean, I, Sam Ackerman going to going to jail. You know, uh, his lieutenants are going to jail um, eventually. It might take a few years for this thing to play out, but you know, they'll go to jail. Um, and I don't. I, I think a lot of. Uh, I don't know. You know um, how deep traditional finance had jumped in to the, the DeFi pool. And it seems like that may have in, uh, insulated them in, in, in a lot of ways. So um, it seems like they, they were waiting for regulation and that's where we are now. We're just waiting for regulation, but it, it is very obvious that like no one knows who to trust. So mm. yeah. Like Gensler. Oh, he. Waiting for wait, waiting for regulations that you know never came because it was, you know, he was full on into the Ponzi scheme himself, uh, or supposedly, right? Um, you know, and, and it is a deep and wide rabbit hole for sure. And the one thing, and you may not have an opinion on this, but Matt and I joke about it: Are they going to bust S SBF's parents? Because they have millions and millions I of dollars. I have no idea, but I guess like it's hard to believe they didn't know anything. Maybe they didn't know yeah. anything. Maybe maybe they didn't know anything. I don't know. But like, it's hard to believe that they didn't know anything. You know, I I don't know. Yeah, there's a certain mentality. I mean, I don't know too much about it um, in raising kids uh, in, in Silicon Valley. Um, and that's really interesting, just the philosophy of how they're taught and raised within certain um, higher ed institutions and at home uh, by their parents. Uh, and it's a whole different set of programming, which is really interesting. Matt, we yeah. should talk about that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting one. Yeah. So so SBF is pleading not guilty. Uh do you think he actually thinks there's a shot here that uh, in some way that he gets I, off or I don't know. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not his lawyer or any lawyer, but like, <laughs> not he's, legally, like but. he's probably going, I would assume he's going to, I hope he goes to jail. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I think, I think the biggest thing is like people were so angry about like, and I was pissed off too. Like after this whole thing went down, it was, this happened the first week in November really is when, everything hit the fan, but he wasn't arrested for like, what, like a month or took like a while, five, yeah. like five weeks. And in that time, he was like going around and giving an interview to everybody and, his, and, and their dog. Right. Like, and that was like, that was so annoying. It was like, just mm. shut up, man. That, that's how I felt. I was like, I don't want to <laughs> hear. It got to a point where like, I was like, I don't, I will not click on this interview with SPF. I, Cause I, I don't want to hear what he has to say anymore. I really don't. Um, and like to some extent, I understand why it took so long. I would imagine you don't want to like bring if you're like the the, the DOJ or, or FBI, or whatever. You don't want to indict someone unless you know you're rock solid. That probably takes like a little while because we all <laughs> kind of found out about this at the same time, right? Um, mm. So I, I can sort of respect a little bit why it took him like a month or so, but like, it, man, it was that bad optics. Holy cow, was that bad optics. Do you think he was trying to make it look like, I mean, I guess he was trying to make it look like he was unaware by doing that big media spree? Because that you're right, that we've never seen anything quite like that. That's totally opposite Madoff, he was a, right? He was advised, yeah. Well, it, so the Madoff thing is interesting because that, if you remember, 
the his sons blew the whistle on him. They went to they, they went to the authorities, so they built their case in 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 secret, and we all found out about it when he got arrested after they'd already d- done done the case work and built written the indictment and the whole thing. This that didn't happen here. We all the public and the regulators found out at the same time. So they clearly were, the regulators were called way off guard. They had no idea what was going on, right? Um, and, it, it, you know, if, if I was in the same neck free shoes, I would think you have two choices. You either say I'm, I'm a fraud or, I, or I'm an idiot, right? Mm. And I, I, I would choose the idiot, right, <laughs> if it were me, right? So right. that's probably what he did. Man. Yeah, it is. Um, I, I share your sentiment. Watching the news or any kind of reporting on this was extremely frustrating. Yeah. And, you know, even though, you know, th- you know, this group and other, you know, not everyone lost money, but it's frustrating because you're yeah. you're the industry you care about. The technology you care about is really getting dinged. And it's almost like it was like an afterthought. And it really isn't. Um, and I think part of that is because, um, you know, regulators, one, the regulator in charge of kind of, I would say, babysitting or cooperating, you know, with SBF was in on it, you know, potentially in on it. So th- that's I, a huge I, 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 I think potentially, I, I think it's premature to say they're in on it. They, yep. they were trying to regulate and they thought they could trust this dude and Clearly, they couldn't. Um, so they're as they're as the regulators are probably as lost as everyone else, and that sucks for the rest of us because the only way that there's going to ever be a flood of institutional capital is if they are confident in the regulation, <clears throat> and we're we're now we're stuck in the standstill. Right. So. Why do you think the regulatory side has been so lost? Because that is a oh, great God. point. And when you know. look at someone like Gensler, you had people who really do understand the fundamentals, at least somewhat. Do you think it's just hard when you get into bureaucracy? It's just there's just so many. I, 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 wish, I wish I knew like you, you could make an argument that like. You know, it, it, it's a bit of a stretch, but like that one of the things that fueled this whole bubble was the lack of a Bitcoin ETF in the U.S. Like, look, Bitcoin Mm -hmm. ETFs, they exist in Europe. They're in in Canada. We don't have one in the U.S. for whatever reason. I don't even, I've lost count of how many times the people, the firms have applied and gotten smacked down uh, by the SEC for a Bitcoin ETF. Um, A Bitcoin spot ETF, not like a futures ETF. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know why we can't have that in the U.S. when they have it in Canada and in Europe. Um, that would be an amazing thing. That would be an crazy. It would give institutions real access to Bitcoin, and it would create another market uh, for for people to do arbitrage with, right? And so I don't I don't know why we don't have that. Um, you you could argue that like the lack of that instrument led to people, led to firms speculating in other areas. It's a bit of a stretch, but like the point I'm trying to make is like, why don't we have an, an, a Bitcoin ETF in the, in the U.S.? It makes no sense. Um, like I, I'm, I'm generally willing to give like the SEC the benefit of the doubt because they're slow and crypto is complicated, but like I don't understand why we can't have this one thing. And that one <laughs> thing would probably solve a lot of problems. That's yeah, right. absolutely. You know, it does, uh, It you know, obviously Bitcoin is kind of the foundational or core uh, economics behind a lot of this um, and having ETFs backed up by it and other, you know, stable coins backed by Bitcoin, not just or any other, tan, you know, hard asset uh, and not just, you know, an algorithm is super important yep. as well. Yep. Um, yep. But the, the whole future of you know, thousands of protocols depend on it. And that's yeah. the economic engine behind this. People just see coins going up and down and whatnot. But what we look at are the actual people and the innovations and the technology that's actually being built on Web3. 
you know, and there's a whole economy that we're, we're using already and other tons of other people are using and people forget that, that there is, it's not just a market meltdown. It's actually a, a, a degeneration of, of protocols and tools. You know, yeah. it's like, uh, you know, if Microsoft, Apple and Adobe, you know, something massive happened to the payment systems or the economics around the payment system, that would be catastrophic. It's the same thing. Yeah. And the ultimate irony of the regulation or the lack thereof is from their point of view, they're being slow because they want to make sure investors are protected and their lack of action probably had a lot to, it was one of the root causes mm. of, or, or one of the reasons why an FTX was able to happen in the first place or a Voyager yeah. who basically, <laughs> Voyager basically lied. They, they said that their deposits were FDIC insured when they, they weren't. Like, yeah. <laughs> they basically lied about it. So yeah, that's like that's uh, just absolutely yeah, bonkers. Like, you know, let's get some regulation. I think is the point. Yeah, yeah. And when it comes to regulation, um, you know, we often talk, and I think this is a really important point for our listeners and anyone else out there to to realize that um, people who really understand this space. And I'm not just talking about investors. I'm talking about developers, CEOs of protocols that are really forging the way through this technology need to rise up and have a voice in helping to drive the right regulations and yeah. not have it force fed to us. Sure. Right. Sure. Sure. sure and sure. everyone's like, oh, you know, we'll wait until uh, we get regulations and everything will be fine. And well, it's like you kind of can't. Because there's only a tiny fraction of people who understand this space, number one. And number two, there's tons of other things they're focusing on. And we actually have to rise and actually, you know, raise our hand and say, no, that's not right. And and or you'll cause problems down the road. So. Sure. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm with you there. I'll say this. If if the day comes and you do and we do get the headline that yeah, the SEC approves a Bitcoin ETF, you will see every crypto rip to the moon that day because oh. that would be that would be the first sign that there's going to be some actual framework in place and so uh, i've been rooting for the etfs myself for quite some time now so me too you make a big distinction say. spencer between bitcoin and and the other the other tokens in your do mind I? do i yeah for sure for Personally. sure i do yeah yeah oh yeah i i, I own bitcoin i own ethereum i own solana they're, in my head they're all Speculative assets, that's how I think about them. But yeah, there's a difference between Bitcoin and Doge, right? Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> for, like, for sure, yeah, there sense. is a difference. Um, <laughs> there's like, so like in my head, it's like Bitcoin and Ethereum are in a class of their own. And then there is everything, then there's everybody else, every other coin or token or uh, Web3 product, right? And and that's just that's just the nature of the, the network effect in their age. Bitcoin and Ethereum are senior citizens compared to everything else, right? Um, uh, sure. Compared to most things. <clears throat> so yeah, I and and they have the most history. So I do think of them as as different for sure. <clears throat> and it's important too for our listeners because I, I've been involved in crypto, if you will mining and all that stuff for many, many years since 2013, right? Wow. <laughs> I feel wow. like an old man. Wow. Yeah, it, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I don't often say that, but uh, um, yeah. So w what I often tell new people to the space, even people who have been in it for maybe a couple of years who, you know, think they're veterans, but they're really not. Um, no one, there's no experts. We're, we're creating the playbook our, our, ourselves on the fly. We're failing in public. Um, and what I will, what I often say is uh, this too shall pass, meaning markets go up, markets go down. And it's unfortunate that they were, they weren't just slow, <laughs> gradual declines because of, you know, global economics. It was corruption and an, an implosion, if you will. So it's going to take a little bit longer to come back, but it will come back. It's too good. The technology is too good. 
Um, and, and it's the only thing we have to separate humans from uh, the corrupted side of, of you know, uh, uh, 2.0 normal banking world. Um, that's all we, we've got. Yeah. Or something new comes yeah. along. Yeah. I mean, you're right. It's so young and there is the lack of um, institutional knowledge. And by institutional knowledge, I just mean knowledge within the crypto community. There's a lack of knowledge about cycles because yeah. we haven't lived through them yet. Right. Like I I'm going to quote Matt Levine again from Bloomberg because he's the greatest. And he said that, <laughs> you know, uh, the world of DeFi and crypto, all they're doing is relearning the lessons of traditional finance just for themselves. They're just relearning all the lessons. Yeah. And in traditional finance, they learn those lessons the hard way with the Great Depression and uh, inflation in the 70s and a crash 87 and a dot-com bubble and a crash of 09, right? They learn these lessons through decades and decades of experience yeah. and, and bubbles yeah. and crashes and bubbles and crashes. We haven't had that yet. And to, to some extent, you know, the timeline's been compressed because there's been a lot of stuff happening in crypto in a very short amount of time. But, like, it's so new, there just there isn't that knowledge yet, that know-how. And that only mm. happens with time. So, yeah, there's a there's a funny chart, kind of meme chart that goes around every couple of years, where it says every time here are the years and the months that pinpoint every time that the media had said crypto is dead, and it's like hundreds, well, it, hundreds well, of days. That, that's every kind of funny. Someone's saying that every all, every day. Someone's saying every day. Right, right, right. 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 It's just funny though. Um, yeah. And you're you're 100 right. People have not, they do not have the historical knowledge. No one actually has it. Some of us have a little bit more. Um, you know, every uh, six months, I thought I was going to lose my cookies uh, yeah. because the markets plunged. And then, you know, like, hey, we're, you know, uh, you, you know, Lambos and unicorns the next day, right? So yeah. it happens quick. It happens fast. You have to have a stomach for it. Yeah. And you just have to understand, you know, uh, where to invest, how to keep things secure, and understand these are cycles, like you were saying, but they're much faster. It's accelerated. It's like Moore's yeah. law, you know? Yeah. Um, so you you got to really... know what kind of person you are and, it, and, and if you can take it. And if you can, yeah. that's again, that's totally fine to admit that to yourself. But it's easy to think on the way up that it's yeah. never going back down. And it's easy to think on the yeah. way down then it's never going back up. And it only seems obvious after the fact. But you just got to know if you can take it or not. And if you can't, get out of the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I learned early on, Spencer, that uh, I tried day trading for a little bit, and it was I just did not have the stomach for it. Yeah, me neither. You have yeah. to have, you know, uh, you, you got to be made out of steel for that. Um, and you really mentally, you know, have to – and and emotionally disconnect yourself from pretty much everything and just go by the numbers. Yeah. And this is more of like an investing credence. It applies not just to crypto, but to everything. And nobody can tell you what it feels like to lose money. You have yeah. to experience it for yourself. And until you do, you do not know what it is like, right? Yeah. Like, no, like until you've lost 50%, you're down 50% in something, in whatever it is, some stock or some some token, you don't know, right? You don't know what that's like until you've lived it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that goes kind of hand in hand with what I've been saying for many, many years to people who are interested in getting into the space or the crypto space, if you will. Uh, I would say, you know what? Put a hundred bucks in, 50 bucks, a yeah, hundred bucks. Yeah. Sit on it. See, yeah. Play with it. Move it around. See how wallets work. Um, watch the markets. Um, if you lose 50 bucks, I'm pretty sure you're not going to be destitute. Yeah. Um, and you know what? Who knows? Wait a couple months and the markets might come back and you might be, you know, 5X on your money. Who knows? But just dip your toes in, understand the cadence and understand the philosophy uh, of this whole thing and why it was started in the first place. Um, and, you know, uh, we were having a conversation uh, with an NFT artist last week and, you know, something really interesting came up. And, you know, when you try, I'm sure you've had this, Spencer, probably a hundred times, just like all of us, where you're trying to explain what the hell crypto is, what the hell is Bitcoin, what the hell is the, what is Web3? Yeah. And, you know, people get really upset because one, 
they don't understand what it is and you're trying to educate them. And the conversation really what we concluded with just meet people in the middle, meet them at their comfort level, you know, um, tell them about why it started and how it works and so maybe some of the fundamentals of the technology, but don't push them into in investing. You know, I've made that mistake before um, and people appreciate it. And once they feel a little more comfortable and they start learning, that's when they'll start to kind of. And, and, and I'll, be, I'll be transparent. There's a lot I don't know about crypto. I am not like a technologist. I like don't understand the intricacies of like Web3. Um, and, and that's and that's fine. And that and all that means is, is I, I'm not speculating on on nfts left and right right that, that that's right. all that means right so just just know where you fit into all of this oh yeah nfts are a whole different story yeah yeah, yeah. That, that, is that kind of the not, biggest investor the mistake way. just in general that you see you know you spent so much time on the ground with investors at benzinga and, and now at magnify that people invest in areas they don't understand yeah yeah and like if you're if you're new and you make money and you're if you're right quickly Man, that's a dangerous thing because it makes you think you know what you're doing. <laughs> and like a lot, I'm seeing, we're seeing it a ton now in the stock market. A lot of people that were day trading from the summer of 2020 till the summer of 2021, you really could have closed your eyes, thrown a dart at the board and made money. It was it really, <laughs> it really was that easy. It really was that easy. Yeah. Um, and for the last six, seven months, it's actually a little bit more. It's been the polar opposite. People that thought they were good realized, oh no, it wasn't me. It was the market. Oops. Right. Mm. So like, you got to know, you got to know what you don't know. Yeah. Every, every, everyone's a Warren Buffett until uh, the markets dip. And then they realize that this stuff is rooted in historical strategy, yeah. you know, um, and, uh, everyone gets a rude smack upside yeah. the head <laughs> yeah. at some well, point. And what strikes me as interesting is everyone's kind of written the obituary. Well, not everyone, but a lot of people have written the obituary for crypto because of some of the drops in price, but you're looking yeah. at major, major market cap companies, you know, the FANG companies and things like that. I mean, they, everybody's taking a hit. Everybody's down right oh, now. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. hardly, it's hardly like this is an isolated thing. Oh, mm -hmm. no, for sure. Um, the, the one thing that the last like seven or eight months have, have proved is uh, the argument that Bitcoin is a hedge is totally out the window. And that's, mm -hmm. again, that's okay, but like, it's not, it's straight up. It's not, it trades with risk assets. It trades with high growth tech stocks. And if high growth tech is going to go up, then so is crypto. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately we are now in a rising rate or at least a higher rate environment, which isn't really great for growth. So, and, and and that's the other thing, right? Is like Bitcoin has never Bitcoin has never existed in a high rate environment, so we literally don't know how it should behave because it's never happened before. So mm. don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, to to the the thought around um, Bitcoin being a hedge, totally agree because I even thought, you know that it was going to outperform and, and beat out S and P and all the stuff. Everyone thought, thought yeah. it would. I, I thought it was so, a hedge for, for a while. Yeah. And I, yeah. We all did. Right. So, yeah. but what I will say though, is even at like $16,800, $17,000 where it's hovering uh, the past couple of months or whatever it is, that's not bad. That's actually Mm -hmm. A lot more stable than that, you know, some of the OG <laughs> investors and the new investors would have thought, you know, if you bought at $62,000 or 30000 sorry, you're going to have to wait a little bit. Um, but if you've been in it for a while, $17,000 is really not that bad, you know? Um, yeah, and I yeah. think it's I mean, starting to hold and it's holding. That's, that is a good sign that it's holding. I, I mean, it could, it could always be worse. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've yeah. been impressed by Ethereum. I mean, it's been holding up around that 1200 range for a while, you know? It just yeah. seems like they've all kind of stabilized at this price, at least for uh, some period of time. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Spencer, uh, out of curiosity, when we talk about these exchanges, 
you know, obviously FTX is no longer there. Uh, people are talking about Binance. What do you see as the future? Do you see exchanges in the crypto landscape even existing in, in the way they do now or, or converging with the conventional investment landscape? What do you, yeah, what so, do you see? So again, like the, the term exchange in crypto, the term exchange is a misnomer because like FTX was an exchange, but also a broker. You, you, you deposited your money at FTX and they were the market. Um, nobody opens an account at NASDAQ, right? NASDAQ and NYSE, they are exchanges. You open your account at brokers like Fidelity and TD Ameritrade. Um, in crypto, there is no such, such, such wall, right? They, they're both, right? Um, which kind of sucks, honestly. Um, but look, I mean, if we're talking about exchanges, um, I mean, just speaking for myself, the crypto that I own is through Coinbase. They are, that's not to say they're safe, uh, <laughs> but they are, I guess, the safest. They're publicly traded in the US. They're registered in the US. Like literally today, the day we're <clears> recording this, they paid a fine for a pretty hefty fine for not knowing their customers. Uh, like, so there is some regulation here for Coinbase. Um, I, I, I feel like this, if, if there is an exchange to trust, it, it would be them because they are the most regulated and you have the most protections. It's not to say that they can't screw you because they definitely are capable of screwing you. Everyone is. But um, uh, that's kind of like how I see it. And there's going to have to be some, this whole thing of like, being being an exchange and a broker at the same time is that's that that's exactly how you get an FTX situation. Is yeah, it's a great insight. There's a, there's a, a reason. A very there's, difference. Yeah. yeah, there's a reason that in the stock market that there are different entities and you have a clearing house too. You have all these different layers, and yeah, it's freaking complicated and, it, and like it slows the process down in a lot of ways. It makes it very inefficient, but it also protects you, right? So, you know. I kind of got to weigh that. Yeah, I think one of the in, in the in the spirit of protection, if you will, uh, I'll say it again. You know, these exchanges, to me at least, uh, they're on ramps and are off ramps, and yep. you should be putting, you know, using soft wallets, secure soft wallets outside of the exchange, and or and more importantly, you know, cold storage. This is something that people. Uh, sure. It's to me, it's the basics. You know. Yeah. For um, sure. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there, I, I agree with you that Coinbase is definitely kind of a little bit more of the foundational kind of exchange. They've played by the rules quite a bit. It for, is for the US most part. Based. For the most part. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. But, you know, here's what people don't realize is, oh, well, Coinbase is great. But, and I'm not saying they will ever do this or they've done it before. But if you look at what happened to FTX, if you look at what, what happened with even with Binance and, and other exchanges, as soon as there is a bank run, there's a run on, on your, your tokens or the exchange, they, they have the ability to pump the brakes. And oh, you have sure. to be okay. You have to be okay with them kind of putting a, a kink in the hose yeah, and yeah. The, on, the on ramps and off ramps. Yeah. Um, that's what you sure. have to realize. For sure, and that's not even unique to crypto. That's that's an every one thing. Um, yeah, that's, exactly. That's in every that's an every asset class thing. Um, you know, it, it happened with uh, GameStop and Robinhood, right? Uh, and, yeah. and that was a that was a different situation, but it underlined that yeah, if things get crazy, then crazy things can happen. To yeah. right, so so yes, it, it's a risk we all take in in investing, and it's why. Um, Having things like SIPC insurance and FDIC insurance is a really important thing because the government mm -hmm. will protect you. If you yeah, I think I mean, there'll be new uh, new assurances uh, through crypto, and you know certainly stable coins, and obviously Bitcoin yeah. will be a big big player in maintaining that foundational uh, kind of uh, security or sense of mind or peace of mind, I should say. Yep. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll see what happens <laughs> what happens with all that for sure. Mm -hmm. I know we're kind of getting close to your time, Spencer, but as we wrap up, I, I'm just curious, uh, what do you think are the stories that people might have missed 
in 2022 because we're this is our first 2023 episode we're looking back obviously we we saw a lot with ftx we saw a lot with the exchanges uh we've talked a bit about stocks what what have people not noticed I don't know if there's anything people people didn't notice. I mean, it's it's pretty self evident that <laughs> that the entire industry got a the crypto market took a bath last year. The one thing that I think is 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 interesting that like I have paid attention to because I'm like a media content nerd is like in in, in a roundabout way, um, a lot of the the negative stuff to come out of crypto was self-inflicted so like for example um what what triggered the the public uh the the public collapse of ftx was that coindesk report about the the almeida balance sheet uh right Uh, that's what triggered it right coindesk and you're seeing it now like coindesk and grayscale and genesis have the same owner right they're owned by the same company Right, uh, and there's now there's we're, we're dealing with that. The, any everyone that's in Genesis, Genesis earned, they're locked out, right, and they can't get their money, right. Um, and so, like, in, in a roundabout way, you know, the like the, the crypto media is is so it's also incestuous, right? Which is it was investigating so it was, itself, basically. Yeah, yeah. it's investigated. It, yeah, and, and so I just thought that was kind of that was kind of ironic in a way. I don't know if there's any headlines that people missed. I think everyone wants to know when crypto will stop going down. It'll probably stop going down when rates go down, whenever that is. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I think everyone is coming into this year having a. It's the exact opposite of where we were twelve months ago, right? True, and yeah, Rich, go ahead. Sorry, no, no. I was just going to say it. It is, and you, you do have to watch the media and and like we were saying before you know uh pundits podcasters reporters everyone's under the gun now everyone's you know in the fryer if you will yeah, uh, yeah. and and that's good we should have it shouldn't be as ruthless as it was um uh but you do need checks and balances even in the media it's fallible it's human it's sure, fallible. for sure De- definitely i would agree with you and um yeah it's just ironic like um, like Coindesk, I, I forget you remember, I think it was Coindesk was like, like Coindesk's parent company is like, they're in, some, they're in trouble right now, right? And it's all because of, uh, not all because, but a lot of it was triggered by a Coindesk report. Like they were doing, they were doing the news yeah. and it's going right. to hurt them. It's going to hurt them now. But like, yeah. that's why you need, to, to your point, Rick, uh, Rich, check, checks and balances. That's why you need that. Independence. Yeah. yeah. Interesting how, like, how fragile, you know, how robust, but on the same token, how fragile the ecosystem is and how interdependent even media is to tokens and it's trading. A, it's, it's actually amazing. Well, stocks it, it, and everything. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. It's, an, it's an amazing point. It's an amazing point. If I was a crypto media outlet right now that depended on advertising revenue or subscription revenue, or affiliate revenue, I would be incredibly nervous because capital has left the building. And when people don't oh, want to yeah. spend, when people don't want to spend money, you're you're in trouble as a business. So like, I'm very I'm very curious to see what happens with like the block and like CoinDesk and like all these like you know the more reputable side of the crypto media and like what happens there. Because they're they're caught up in this too. Yeah, it, it is, it, and these are great points, Spencer. Because um, we look at things, we you know we have uh, kind of an eye on the private equity and the venture side of things um, by nature of of our uh, holding company, River Capital Holdings. Um, we're always looking at products. We're always looking at people and services and and where to invest and. You know, um, both in Web3 and traditional investments, yeah, you're 100% right. The money has left the building. It's not gone forever. Um, People know. um, We talk to these folks all the time. They know. And that Web3 is the future. Um, They're very excited about it, but extremely cautious. Um, 
And they, they, they too got caught up in the fever pitch of, you know, let's just jump in uh, instead of kicking the tires, you know, all four tires, not just one. <laughs> yeah. Well, Look, we're everyone... still seeing the, yeah. the VC side. We're still seeing VC uh, investment and, and long-term that's, project development. That's great. That's yeah. great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. Uh, you still have to, you know, mind your P's and Q's, of course, uh, yeah. and don't build Ponzi schemes. But uh, well, yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's there. Uh, but what, what I would I would leave off, uh, Spencer, with our audience and everything else, and we say it all the time: there is still the right people are doing the right things by Web three and crypto, meaning the developers, the builders, the true entrepreneurs and innovators who are who really see it as a differentiator, um, not only in markets, but in humanity. They, they, they are pushing forward, including ourselves, you know, um, but it is a little scary. <laughs> yeah. And it will probably just take time. There, you know, yeah. there is no shortcut in this. It will just take time and you have to know that going in and that's, that's acceptable. If you can accept that, the, the, the time risk, then have at it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Great point. So wrapping up, uh, you're a Benzinga guy before. Yeah. Now you're uh, you're at. Well, why am I not even remembering the name right now? <laughs> so it's complicated. So I'll explain it to you. So I, I work for a company called um, Magnify. Magnify is parent company is called Tiffin. They're a financial services firm. They've raised you know a quarter billion dollars in. Uh, in, in venture capital, they, they, they've been, been around a few years. Uh, so Tiffin's parent company is Magnify. Magnify itself is sort of a parent company in its own right. Um, and they've got a bunch of properties, one of which is called All-Star Charts, which this guy, JC Perez founded about 11 or 12 years ago now, which is just technical analysis research on everything, on stocks, on crypto, on commodities, on Forex, whatever. Right. Uh, so what I'm doing now is sort of kind of what I was doing before Benzinga, but uh, just kind of taking and going into their their video operation and just overseeing all the video stuff that that all star charts does and eventually broadening that out to the other properties under the magnify umbrella. Um, and this is all within the parent of Tiffin. So you got Tiffin, you got magnify, and then you got all these little properties on the, under there. They're all kind of folding into one, um, and that, and we'll be producing content and video, um, you know, for all, for all them. Uh, and I'd be remiss to say, because it's literally this is my second day of this job, but I, I'd be remiss to say that every, for 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 us for uh, magnifying for all star charts every Friday for us is Crypto Friday, right? So I'm just gonna drop my email out there. It's literally Spencer at AllStarCharts.com. If you email me, I will get you into the weekly meeting for free, and you so, can see if if you like it. And if you don't, that's totally cool. But and and so, is there anything else at Magnify you recommend our listeners check out? Obviously, um, I don't think there's going to be a lot of content coming up. Magnify has a pretty cool um, offering. Their their whole shtick uh, is like personalization of finance, um, and so the, 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 their goal is to make is, is, is for you, like for you to open an account like at, at Magnify, right? And you get the most personalized news and content that's for you, right? That that's their goal. So they've got um, a, a, a brokerage product right now, um, and they, they they're doing some pretty cool things with like AI, and you can like search for specific topics and specific themes. Um, so there's a lot happening like at that level. Um, I'm sort of at the level below that, um, operating on like the, the content side. Um, but I would definitely, it's magnify with an I, so it's M A G N I F I, um, not with a Y and, um, yeah, definitely check it out. We'll be sure to include those links. Uh, Spencer, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, uh, I, really interesting I appreciate chat. It. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Thank you. Fun. Very Excellent. insightful. Uh, and thank you for your time. And we look forward to talking again and checking out, you know, uh, sure. all-star charts as well probably get involved with that with you. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. Yeah. Cheers.